Um, I think, I mean, I know that that would be super. Um, I do think that we might have a couple more people joining us, but that's okay. Um, yay, it's recording. So um, I'm going to get ready to introduce the session, but what I was starting to say is that we have done this when there's time at the end. Um, we have uh, turned off the recording and given people the opportunity to just kind of uh, turn their cameras on, or turn their mics on, and uh, kind of interact with one another because I'm sure many of us are missing uh, some of that interaction in our lives. So, um, all right. So I'm Jenny, uh, Information Literacy Coordinator. Um, and as many of you know, I proposed this virtual learning community to promote some peer learning opportunities to build some community within the libraries during this pandemic. Um, I know I, I, in the first couple weeks, I said many of you are working remotely. Now, I guess the reality is that we are all working remotely. Um, and so I hope this gives you um, some opportunities to learn and to share even while we're working in this kind of setting, but also I hope that um, it uh, gives you something to some some things to do to break up your day, that kind of thing. So I will have an archived version of this recording later. Um, and if you want to see what else we have recorded or what we already have planned and also what's up on our archive um, from YouTube recordings. Uh, it is on our LibGuide, which is at uncg.libguides.com, slash so ULVLC. Um, if you ever have questions about this, please feel free to email me at any time. Um, I'm going to just cover some basic logistics here. So if you are not, um, there will be opportunities for people to speak during Maggie's sort of facilitated discussion. Um, if you are not currently speaking, please make sure that your microphone is off. I think everyone's um, got their mics off at this point. Um, Maggie will also be asking you at certain points to raise your hand um, if you want to speak about some specific works of art. Um, and I'll let her talk more about that. But if you're ever having trouble finding that, just put your question in the chat. Um, the raise hand option is in the participants window. Um, we again will have there will be some opportunities for you to uh, speak and answer questions using your microphones but if you have questions throughout especially as Maggie's presenting in this first segment please put those in the chat and I'll be um, kind of keeping track of those um, so that whenever there are breaks I can ask those questions to Maggie. If you have any technical issues please feel free to use the chat and I'll try to guide you through some solutions. Um, if you, like if something major happens, your audio is not working, your internet goes out, I don't know how you'd be chatting me then. Um, but just know that the session is being recorded and it will be up on YouTube and then available through our guide. So before I introduce uh, Maggie, does anybody have any questions? Many of you are uh, old school, original ULVLC participants. I've seen many of you here before. Okay. Um, so this session is being hosted by Maggie Murphy, UNCG's first year writing visual art and humanities librarian. She's going to be explaining visual thinking strategies and leading us through a facilitated discussion of applying this method or these strategies to some visual artworks. So I'm going to mute myself, turn it over to Maggie, and let it begin. Hi, everybody. Um, I am kind of nervous about this, I realize, because I haven't taught in like three weeks. Um, so I feel a little rusty, so please be patient with me if I'm like stumbling over my words. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I have this like weird persistent anxiety right now. Maybe I'm just totally alone in that, JK. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to get started. Um, so I'm going to start talking about visual thinking strategies. Um, and then talk about its applications uh, outside of art education. So it's a technique that uses art, um, but is not necessarily about art. And then I'm going to talk about um, how it's been used by librarians. Uh, and then we're going to practice using it in a discussion. Um, for some context, uh, I attended a two day um, training to uh, start working on becoming a certified facilitator of visual thinking strategies in December. 
Um, and as part of that, I'm supposed to practice facilitating sessions. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I'll give you my fonts at the end. Um, and so uh, I am not an expert at facilitating discussions. Um, and it is bizarrely hard given how simple it is. Uh, so we're all just in this experiment together. Okay. Um, so visual thinking strategies is a teaching method uh, that was developed in the 1990s um, to encourage beginning viewers of art to feel empowered to engage conversation in conversations about art in museum settings. Um, so Philip Yanowin, uh, I think that's how they say it, um, was the director of education at MoMA um, in the 1980s uh, up through the say mid 1990s. Um, and he was in charge of uh, figuring out why people who came in for tours, um, uh, guided tours with docents in the museum didn't seem to um, be able to retain the information that the docents gave them about artworks. Um, and uh, so he uh, hired a cognitive psychologist, Abigail Hausen, um, to do some research. Uh, and so what Hausen found was that um, people shut down in conversations about art as soon as um, docents or facilitators uh, introduce specialized knowledge about visual art. So if you're asking people to look at art and ask them what they think, um, they'll engage. But as soon as you start introducing information like biographical details of the artist, um, historical context, uh, you know, sort of specialized vocabulary around uh, formalistic or stylistic elements with beginning viewers, um, they start sort of listening and get into the mode where they are recipients of expert knowledge rather than um, feeling empowered to uh, engage in looking and thinking about art on their own. And so um, visual thinking strategies uh, is a teaching method that came out of this research. Um, and so it uses three deliberately phrased questions um, that invite learners to freely share observations about art. And so it's really simple. Um, these are the three questions. What's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And you can sub in something specific for that. And then what more can you or we find? Um, and these are phrased uh, very specifically um, to keep the discussion open-ended. Uh, the facilitator um, engages in some specific steps. Um, so first, uh, you're supposed to allow people to look um, before anyone starts talking at the artwork silently. You look for 30 seconds a minute. Um, then the facilitator has to be sure to uh, listen carefully to the speaker's observations and engage in what's called visual paraphrase. Um, so you are pointing uh, as the, speak the learners are speaking um, to whatever they're talking about. Uh, then you verbally paraphrase each comment back to them in conditional language. This is really important in visual thinking strategies is that you never affirm um, what someone is saying uh, as correct um, or you don't correct them uh, if they are wrong. Um, and I'll get into that in a moment. But so everything is paraphrased in conditional language to keep it open-ended. The goal of the facilitator is also to make connections between related comments so that the participants um, can see connections and build upon ideas uh, and acknowledge each comment neutrally. And this is really hard. Um, <laughs> uh, as um, many people who interact with me know that anytime someone asks me a question, my immediate response is, that's a great question. Uh, that is not a neutral um, acknowledgement. I'm calling the question great. And if I accidentally respond to the next person, that's a good question, um, then I did not acknowledge the comments in the same way. So you're not supposed to um, say like, great, awesome, you know, oh, interesting observation, none of that. You're supposed to keep it completely neutral. Um, so the goals of visual thinking strategies are really narrow in scope. Um, this is not supposed to be um, a substitute for content-based art education. So no one is suggesting that having these open-ended, context-free discussions of art are a substitute for 
art history education. Um, however, the skills that are developed, and there's ton, there's just decades of, well, I guess like two decades of research about this, um, and I have plenty of references at the end uh, for you to look at, um, are uh, transferable beyond art. So you're using art as um, a way to help people engage in these conversations. Um, and so the outcomes are to be able to look carefully at complex works. And I have an asterisk there um, because this is transferable beyond visual art to looking at written texts, um, to looking at objects, um, all kinds of uh, things that could be um, creative works or also primary sources to engage in thoughtful, sustained analysis. Yes, Sarah, music also. Um, the conversation, uh, you keep it going for as long as people have things to say within whatever time constraints you have, um, but you're supposed to spend a lot of time with, a, with one work. Um, the big goal is for learners to be able to make inferences um, from their analysis, uh, their, you know, their sort of empirical observation, and then they are asked to back up those ideas with evidence. Um, with visual art, it's visual evidence, and that's that question, what do you see that makes you say whatever? Um, also, the collaborative conversation, they're listening to the views of others, um, building on what they hear, and uh, the ability to shift perspective based on new evidence. Um, you may go into the conversation thinking that you see something specific and then change your mind when somebody um, you know, says something else and then gives their evidence. And this is really important, um, especially I, I, anyone who works um, with college students, especially first year students, knows that um, having a variety of interpretations, the idea that um, there are perhaps multiple valuable uh, perspectives on an issue instead of just black and white, right or wrong, and being able to tolerate ambiguity. These are really important skills um, to have uh, in academic contexts as well as in real life. Um, and then additionally, uh, visual thinking strategies connects really clearly and literally to um, the third standard of the current ACRL visual literacy competency standards. Um, so I have an asterisk there because these are being revised. Um, they are um, kind of an old school model of standards that are being phased out by the Association of College and Research Libraries. Um, sorry, I think somebody's taking a shower upstairs. I don't know if you can hear the, the water running. Um, it's very loud. Uh, but um, so these are being revised to be more aligned with the ACRL framework for ACRL, not ACRL, which is the Southeast Research Libraries Consortium, but they all sound the same, uh, depending on your accent. Um, we're revising the standards. I'm on a working group that is doing that. Um, and so I have uh, here some bulleted points um, that I've pulled out of the outcomes. But if we just take a look at these really quickly, and I'm going to go down to standard three. I have a little bit of lag here on my mouse for some reason. OK. Um, standard three uh, interprets and analyzes the meaning of images and visual media. Um, and so to be able to look at an image, observe content and physical details, um, identify subject, uh, recognize when more information about an image is needed, and I'll get into this in just a second, um, and conducts additional research as appropriate. Um, uh, situates an image in cultural, social, and historical context. Um, and so the idea of visual thinking strategies is that the facilitator doesn't give you any information about the image. Um, not who the creator is, not when it was created, not any um, like social context, not anything about their intentions. None of that is given by the facilitator. Depending on who is taking part in the conversation, everyone might have a level of knowledge about an image where they start engaging in um, discussion about cultural and historical information. Um, regardless of whether they have that context, you can still um, engage in sophisticated conversations about gender, ethnicity, um, cultural and social aspects. Um, but uh, the idea is that this um, technique would be used in concert with 
context specific um, content based art education, uh, or um, if you're doing primary sources, other kinds of creative works, um, it's a, usually used as a conversation starter. And then you um, give students the information they would need to be able to con uh, conduct additional research and um, learn what might be the kind of objective uh, information about the image. Um, and then finally, uh, describe pictorial, graphic, and aesthetic elements. Um, and then these outcomes all uh, relate to the discussion. Um, participate in discussions, seek expert and scholarly opinions. Again, that is what you're prompted to do after the conversation if you want to. And again, depending on who takes part in the conversation, um, you're going to introduce discipline-specific perspectives and approaches. Uh, and so um, it's a really important point that because visual thinking strategies purposely abstracts art images from their original context, you really don't want to use images um, where having conversations where every perspective or interpretation is equally valid could be harmful. Um, to the original creator, to people taking part in the conversation. Um, I wouldn't want to use any image where the, uh, the artist's intentions are really like deeply connected with identity um, or uh, historical events or things that are really important to particular cultures. Um, and so image choice is really important. You can choose not to do VTS with an image, essentially. Um, so this is a strategy that is used in art education. That's where it comes from, museum education, um, getting people to talk about art. But it's actually used, um, so using art uh, to develop these other kinds of critical thinking skills is used beyond art education. Um, and so it is used very widely uh, in medical and health science education. Um, uh, I have a reading list at the end, um, and so it's used with medical and nursing students, also practicing physicians and surgeons, and then there are additional studies um, with students in pharmacy, public health, uh, dermatology, and so um, they have uh, students and practitioners come into museums to have visual thinking strategies conversations, um, and the goal is to um, help these practitioners and students uh, develop um, attention to detail and observation uh, and build empathy um, so that they can transfer that into their practice. Um, we also see many of application or many applications outside of art education and appreciation in K-12 classrooms. Um, the uh, idea to be able to look closely at a work. Um, yes, I think they have, Carolyn, I think you're right. Um, look closely at a work uh, and um, look at context clues, um, make inferences, evidence, applies to language arts and K through 12, um, using art as a prompt um, and uh, having discussions about interpretation is really useful for creative writing. And then um, there uh, are studies about this in K through 12 mathematics, which I don't really understand as a humanities person, but there's a reading at the end that you can look at if you want to. Um, science, they use it with uh, objects, like earth science objects, um, photos of cells, things like that. Uh, social studies, really clear applications um, to history, uh, to civics. And then in higher education, it's been used in all of these different um, fields and subjects, and there are readings again. So visual thinking strategies and librarianship. Um, it's been used in a variety of ways. Uh, some people have made explicit connections to concepts within the ACRL framework for information literacy. Uh, literacy. Um, and so if you're unfamiliar with that, this is a document that was um, adopted in, it was filed in 2015, adopted in 2016. And again, my mouse is lagging, so just give me a second. And so this is the main professional document for um, academic librarians who teach students anything having to do with finding, um, evaluating, 
using, accessing, creating, citing information. Um, and it is a document that is um, formulated differently. There are no learning outcomes. There are no performance indicators. Um, it's much more theoretical and interpretive um, than uh, like strictly meant for assessment. Um, and it's divided into six frames. Uh, and so each frame has um, sort of uh, a paragraph explaining how it relates to um, being able to find, analyze, use, credit, create information in all of its forms. And so the connections that people have made um, with visual thinking strategies is um, the idea of research as inquiry connects to the idea that you are doing empirical research when you are engaging in that observation. Um, and you have to seek out and provide and articulate your evidence. Scholarship as a conversation uh, relates to that idea that if you are, uh, now there are people cutting grass outside. Uh, apologies for that also. I'm gonna try to shut my window really quick. Sorry. Okay, um, so the idea that uh, if you are engaging in research by having this collaborative uh, conversation, um, looking, um, observing, uh, then your conversation together is a form of scholarship. Um, there are many examples um, of art librarians using this with art history courses, um, but there are also examples of librarians using this with first year seminars. Um, so this is a poster that was presented um, by uh, these two folks, uh, and I'm just gonna click here so we can get the contextual information. And so they, again, my mouse lagging, Cool, cool, cool. Um, so they use visual thinking strategies with a um, first year university studies seminar to um, help students um, develop confidence, um, metacognition, thinking about thinking. Um, they did journal entries. Um, it focuses on the student discovery process. Um, instead of being lectured at, having students engage in their own interpretation instead of um, receiving expert information and memorizing it. Uh, also, um, I think this is really interesting. If anyone has ever uh, been to a library instruction session or taught one, um, hopefully that is kind of between everybody in the audience right now. Um, this uh, is a presentation that someone gave at a conference that I had never heard of before um, about using visual thinking strategies in first year uh, library instruction. And so instead of using a work of art, this librarian is like, okay, let's take a look at this screen right here. Uh, you know, what's going on here? Um, what do you see? And so having students observe um, database interfaces, um, search results, and trying to dissect what is happening there. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Thanks everybody, it was not my idea, but I like it. Um, and then lastly, um, I don't have a slide for this, but as somebody who works with um, first year writing classes, um, teaching students about uh, paraphrase, summary and quotation is something um, that is sort of taught collaboratively between first year writing instructors and librarians um, because it is um, a set of uh, like ways of thinking about outside sources that applies to both sort of research um, and citation and also writing. Uh, and because um, the facilitator of visual thinking strategies conversations has to paraphrase back what people say. Um, I think it's a really interesting way to demonstrate paraphrase and action um, in that when you are paraphrasing uh, someone, you are not, is not your idea. And that is um, something that a lot of new um, writers and researchers and first year writing uh, don't always understand why they have to cite someone else if they're paraphrasing um, from them, uh, that it, putting it in their own words doesn't make it their own idea. And so seeing this in action, um, you know, where the facilitator is very clearly not the one who made the observation, everyone was right there to see it, um, but they're paraphrasing it back. I can imagine having a visual thinking strategies conversation and then referring back to it to talk about paraphrase. Okay, um, so now 
uh, I would like to have um, some sample visual thinking strategies conversations. I have two works of art. Um, and as Jenny said, uh, what I'm planning to do is um, if we were in person, we would be a group of people standing in front of a work of art at a museum or we'd be in a classroom and I'd have it projected on the screen. But we are all in our own living rooms or, you know, offices if you have one. I'm at a desk right off of my little kitchenette in this apartment. Um, and so what we have here is uh, I have a menu of participants. Everybody is muted. Um, and as Jenny said, um, if you find the participants menu in Zoom, and I'm not sure if everyone's connected from a laptop, um, if you're using the Zoom like browser application versus the software or you're on your phone or an iPad, um, but I'm hoping that you can find um, a menu that says participants and you'll see the list of everybody in the session right now. Um, and if you do that, you should also see a way to raise your hand. Uh, and this is, again, um, how it would work in person. We would be a group of people. Um, you're going to engage in some silent looking uh, at the image before I start talking. And then uh, I'm going to call on people who have their hands raised to talk. Um, and so we will move through the conversation like that. Um, and so Jenny's giving you some instructions there. Um, if somebody wants to practice raising their hand, maybe, or if you all want to practice that for a second, just see if you can do it. Sarah, Rachel, Catherine, uh, Suzanne, Darren Lee, MK, Carolyn, Patrick, I'm Evan, Shonda. It moves you out of alphabetical order towards the top, so I'm not sure. Um, if I, Anna, okay, so is anyone having trouble raising their hand? Everybody feel okay about it? Um, so when you raise your hand, I will acknowledge you, Vanessa, I see, okay. Um, and then I'll unmute you and then you can share your observation. It's gonna feel a little disjointed and silly. Um, and in fact, I just wanna be clear, the whole thing can feel a little goofy um, because I'm going to be asking you to provide evidence uh, for observations where you're like, uh, that's an apple. Like everyone can see that's an apple. What do you mean? Uh, what do you see that makes me say that that's an apple? Um, just go with it. Uh, Cause you'll see, this is mostly used with children, um, but it can also be used with adults. Again, medical students, um, nurses. And so it, even if it feels goofy, um, we are doing something beautiful here together, I promise. Okay, um, so I'm going to uh, show you this image and we're gonna take um, a little bit of time to all look at it silently before we start talking. Okay, so what's going on in this picture? All right, Darren Lee, let me see if I can unmute you. I think what's going on in this picture is someone's creating something. Okay, so what do you see that makes you say that someone's creating something? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> um, ah. There we go. Okay. okay. Forget what you just saw. What do you see uh, that makes you say that someone's creating something? It looks to me like um, the person sitting at the desk is uh, painting a picture and that the birds are coming out of said picture and flying around. Okay, so Darren Lee is saying that this figure here 
um, what she's calling a person uh, is sitting at something that looks like a desk. Um, and uh, you said creating something? Um, and yes, so, uh, a painting. It a painting, okay. Um, and so uh, there appear to be um, birds, uh, perhaps these, um, emerging from it uh, and uh, flying around, taking flight. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, so what more can we find? Okay, so I see Evan's and so we'll hear from Evan now. All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. So what I see is um, it, it seems to me to represent uh, the idea of taking art and experiences from the outside world and turning them into your own experiences. Um, I get that from the kind of transmuting stand pulling in some substance from the window to the left okay so um turning it into paint and then um they're using for instance the strings from the violin around their neck and mm -hmm. those same paints and then painting birds which um, my interpretation is that the person who's painting is a bird-like thing um and then those birds then go out into the world okay um so Evan is seeing something almost allegorical here, um, representing uh, transformation and creation. Um, Evan saw uh, this as a window over here, um, pulling in um, some kind of substance or matter from the outside world, um, which is then turning into uh, paint um, and is somehow uh, contributing through um, what looks like a violin or some other musical instrument, a string coming down and relating um, to the creation of these birds, um, which can then fly out into the greater world. Is that right, more or less? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Evan, what do you see that makes you say um, that there is like a world outside uh, this image? Um, I see like clouds or hazy substance outside, okay. um, but so like again, this kind yeah. of sense? Okay. Yeah, it could, it could be more nothingness, but um, we're, I'm left to assume that um, it's, it's something else, so. Okay, um, so what else can we find? Uh, Brown raised his hand, um, so I'm going to unmute him, lower hand. Can you, can you hear me all right? Yeah. So it's, it's I, I see things like there's like the colors on the palette seem to be important coming out of the distillation device. Like it okay. seems like it's important that it's blue and yellow and red. Um, Okay, so you're you're seeing colors coming out of this sort of you called it a device um, uh, onto what looks like a palette, mm -hmm. and uh, you're seeing um, the perhaps the primary colors used uh, in in art. And and it looks like this bird person is distilling something from nature and extracting from it these component colors, but then animating birds using maybe somehow or another focused starlight or something like that. Okay, um, so uh, Brown is seeing um, this sort of, not quite Rube Goldberg machine, but some kind of device over here um, using the word distillation uh, to create these colors um, on a palette um, and creating uh, you, you said? Uh, starlight, I guess. Yes, channeling starlight um, down uh, and using it to animate these birds. Um, okay. Uh, and you called this a bird-like figure. Um, I guess what I'll ask you, what, what do you see that makes you say the figure um, seated at what uh, 
I think Darren Lee said was a desk, um, is bird-like. Well, the feathers, but also the, like the, the kind of parabolic shapes around their eyes look almost like an owl. Okay. Okay, so we have some feathers and then also parabolic. Um, yeah, the, the sort of, it looks like a barn owl kind of, the uh, sort of flat, uh, circular eyes. Okay, um, so what more can we find? Uh, I see Joe's hand raised, so I'm going to unmute them and lower their hand. Um, can you all hear me? Oh, I'm having a little trouble hearing you, Joe. Oh, what about now? That's better. All right, cool. I had to switch mics. Um, so I see in the background, um, there's a hopper, kind of like, looks like maybe a food grinder. Um, and then there's okay, a bird yeah. eating small ground up pieces. So to me, that kind of suggests that like, even though the birds on the upper right are moving and leaving the room, at least one stuck around, I guess, <laughs> or maybe was the, um, the, the inspiration for the birds being painted, maybe. Interesting. Okay. Um, so Joe is seeing some kind of food grinder. You said a hopper. I'm not familiar with that. Vocabulary. Yeah, I play Minecraft. Um, it okay. Is, okay. It is, so like you put your, your food or your weed or something into okay. that, that thing on the top, the hopper, like funnel. Okay. And it goes down into a grinder mechanism and you grind it up. Okay. Um, and uh, then there is a bird looking like it is eating something down here. Um, and so Joe sees this as suggestive that um, even though uh, these birds seem to be flying away, this bird is staying. Um, and Joe, you said that uh, you see perhaps that this bird is the inspiration for these birds. Is that right? Yeah, either that or it was one of the birds that was painted, but there's also the spigots on the weird pear-shaped thingies. Mm -hmm. um, they're pointing down and they're That's not... Okay in use, but I'm wondering if maybe at some point that bird also gets some paint. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, Joe's thinking about the sort of um, chronology of, of what's being shown here. Um, if this bird um, perhaps was created through the same process that others have suggested have created these birds um, and has decided to stay or is actually like uh, generative of these birds somehow. Um, and that uh, this process up here um, is perhaps being uh, reproduced at points um, using these uh, spigots, um, or perhaps uh, they don't seem to be in use to Joe, um, but uh, they have been or could be in use um, in a similar way. Okay. Um, just as a contextual note, because Joe gave me a ton of evidence there, I'm not going to ask them, what do you see that makes you say that? And that is part of the process. Um, so I'm just gonna move on and say, okay, what more can we find? Okay, I see Alyssa's hand raised. So I'm going to unmute Alyssa and lower Alyssa's hand. Hey. Hey. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I see a couple of things. Okay. The first thing that was interesting to me is that the person's paintbrush or or instrument, writing instrument. This right here? Uh, yeah. It looks like it's connected somehow to the instrument they're wearing around their neck. Okay. Um, and I wonder what significance, if any, that has with, um, well, the person is wearing it like near their throat. Okay. Um, and wonder how that, like what that means for like the birds, um, the bird yeah. noises. <laughs> oh, the bird noises. Okay, interesting. Um, so uh, Alyssa is observing, um, as uh, Evan did earlier, I think that this string that is coming down into some kind of perhaps writing or um, drawing implement uh, is 
connected to what appears to be some kind of musical instrument. Um, and Alyssa observed that um, this figure is wearing, uh, appears to be wearing this instrument around its throat um, and making a connection between the throat and the idea and uh, an instrument that can create sound um, to perhaps uh, the noises that birds make. Um, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, I think. I'm gonna leave it at that. Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, the the um, other so, thing I was. Oh, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. The other thing I was seeing um, is in the far corner. There's like a two vase-like things right here. Um. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think I have a delay on your pointer. Oh, sorry. Um, and I don't really have a comment about that, except that I'm a little mystified by like what, <laughs> what it is. Okay, um, so Alyssa's pointing out um, something here in uh, what looks like a corner of the room um, that appear to be uh, two vases. All right, what more can we find? One, dig deep, take one more person. Okay, Amy. All right, um, I don't think anybody has said this yet. I hope not, but um, it appears that, so I know people have talked about this creature's owl-like eyes. Yes, um, round-noted eyes. Yes, and then how, but, and, and I would say even their owl, like, head, mm, um, okay. but a human, like, nose and mouth, but they also have very well-defined human, like, hands and feet, um, but it appears that the, I don't know, they have sort of an, an owl or bird-like torso that extends into human like arms and legs and feet which are very like detail they're they're drawn with a lot of detail okay so amy is noting the sort of composition of this figure which many other people have mentioned um at least in passing referring to the sort of prominent figure in the middle of this image, um, sort of looking at the, the shape of the head and the eyes as bird or owl-like, but then noting that um, the nose and mouth and also uh, the hands and feet appear to be um, more well-defined and you said really detailed, um, like human-like uh, appendages. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so what do you see that makes you say that these are human uh, hands and feet? Um, well, they, let's see, the, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear that, but, um, okay, sorry about that. Um, everybody hears my children, hey, okay. So I, the, um, they appear to have five fingers and five toes on each hand and foot. Um, the left hand appears to have an opposable thumb. Okay. Um, and the feet have, I don't know, they definitely look like they have toes and heels. And um, yeah, those are the things I would say. Okay. So Amy is looking uh, in sort of um, more depth at the makeup of these appendages, uh, noting the number of fingers and toes, or what appear to be fingers and toes, and the presence of an opposable thumb, um, which uh, is something uh, that definitely uh, is unique to uh, primates. <laughs> um, uh, I know my cat doesn't have an opposable thumb, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so Amy is uh, noting the similarities of these um, fingers and toes to that of a person. Uh, is that right? 
Yes, that is correct. Great. Oh, I said great. I shouldn't have said that. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, thank you everyone uh, for taking part in that conversation. Um, we're going to do this with another image. Uh, and so I'm going to switch over to that. You got a preview of it earlier when I accidentally brought it up. Um, and so we're going to look at it silently. Uh, and then, <laughs> no. Um, okay, so I'm getting questions. Can you, I tell you a little bit about the painting? Um, yes, I'm going to do that at the end, um, both of, of this image and the next one. Um, I don't know if those fruit things are eggs. Uh, I literally don't know, um, but that's a great observation uh, that uh, if we continued, you could have brought up. Nobody said anything about the shirt, giant olives. I love all of this. Okay. Um, we could keep talking about this forever, but I want to try it with one more image. Um, so you can see that even though uh, the conversation is coming to an end, we could have kept going. Um, people are sharing thoughts that they had privately, but didn't want to share with the group. Wow. Wow, Jenny and Anna. Okay. Um, perhaps you'll have things to say about the next image. So again, we're going to take a look at this quietly. Okay, so what's going on in this picture? Uh, Joe's raising their hand. I wanna see if we get any hands raised by someone who did not talk the first time around. Joe, you can keep your hand up. Um, Anna, okay, let's hear from Anna. So can y'all hear me? Yes. Great, so I see either a struggle or an effort to um, protect and pull this group together. And I can't, I'm not totally sure which one it is. I see the dog looks like it's barking, um, like hands are out grabbing things, maybe pulling things together or pushing things away. Uh, it looks like somebody is holding a shield. You don't see any faces. They're all, the faces are all covered. Okay. Um, so it's hard to, to know what emotions those people are feeling. I mean, I imagine that they are people from the way that they are shaped. Um, so I don't know if they're trying to pull each other together to protect or if they are fighting with one another and trying to push each other away. Okay, so Anna's looking at this group of what she is calling people, um, uh, noting that their faces all seem to be obscured. There's a dog that appears to be barking and is wondering um, if uh, we are seeing some kind of struggle between these people um, or if there is some effort um, between them to sort of form a protective unit. Yes. Okay. Um, and so you mentioned um, that someone is holding a shield. What do you see that makes you say uh, that there's a shield here? So there's uh, the person in the kind of coral colored outfit, nice shirt, okay. has a, something circular that they are holding that looks like it might be attached to a fork. Uh, that's, a fork is not shield-like. However, um, a shield has a handle usually, and it can be used to block things, which looks like might be happening here. Okay, so you're seeing this sort of circular thing um, and something about the way it's being held, even though we can't see a handle. And you're noting this uh, sort of 
shape coming out of it as being fork-like, um, but that it's being brandished in a way that suggests it's being used as a shield to sort of block something. Yes. Okay. Uh, what more can we find? All right, we're gonna go with Joe. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Oh, cool, okay. Um, so like, I also see a struggle okay. at first. I was, you know, like agreeing with Rachel that like this painting scares me, but like the more I look at it, it more it reminds me of like a bunch of kids scuffling in the street. Um, okay, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, one of them's wearing like a paper hat, a uh, boat hat. One of them like is using a trash can lid as a shield and has what looks like a like a plastic fork maybe with a pot on their head. Um, another kid, I think, has like a shirt or something on their head and it looks kind of like like they have a wooden sword in their hand but they got i got guess got got by this shirt um uh and it's trying to they're trying to get it off their head and then there's like like a street dog just kind of in the fray too it's, it seems kind of super chaotic but it reminds me of a bunch of kids okay so joe sorry this menu thing is popping up um blocking the bottom half of the image um so joe is seeing uh what appeared to be a, a group of children um, sort of struggling, noting um, that this perhaps looks like a trash can lid. Um, this, uh, Joe said, is maybe a boat. Um, uh, this perhaps looks like a shirt over this person's head. Um, because I'm moving my mouse, uh, again, I am blocking um, what appears to be a wooden sword across the bottom. Um, and Joe, uh, characterize this as a struggle. Um, Joe, what do you see that makes you say that this is a struggle? Anna wasn't sure it was a struggle. Um, so I think the shirt being on that one person's head and their hands reaching up, um, I would say to try and get it off. Um, like seeing the, the helmet of a, a pot or a pan on a person's head and then seeing like the sword and a shield Another person has like a, a ripped off like plank of wood or something and it looks kind of like they're either holding it to try and get the person and coral away from them or to like maybe they were trying to hit them with it um <laughs> there's a lot of okay wood. so joe seeing w w what might otherwise be sort of commonplace everyday objects um being used in a way that suggests weapons um, and, uh, or being used to sort of, um, interact with other people in a way that suggests, uh, a struggle of some kind. Okay. Uh, what more can we find? Okay. Shonda. I haven't heard from Shonda. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, so I kind of agree with Joe. I saw it as children, but it also sort of reminded me, made me think of like old pictures of inner cities and poor neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. so I wondered if the artist was trying to make some type of statement against poverty. Okay, um, so Shonda is seeing, uh, similar to what Joe said, um, a struggle. Uh, Shonda, did you say also you see children? Yeah, I see that. I view that as children. And I think like Joe mentioned, they're just using what they have to play. They can't, don't have toys. Just reminded me of lots of old pictures you see from the 40s and 50s, inner city kids playing. Okay, so um, Shonda's making a connection between these sort of commonplace everyday objects and the sort of lack of dedicated toys, right? Like the idea that they don't have things that are meant to be toys. Um, and so uh, you said it's reminiscent of images of an inner city in the 40s or 50s. What makes you think, uh, or what do you see that uh, makes you say that this is um, depicting an inner city? Honestly, it just reminds me of a photograph of my father playing with his friends in Philadelphia, inner city. It just it looks exactly like that, honestly. Okay. Um, so uh, Shonda is seeing um, the, the image here and is reminded of actual documentary photographs um, from Philadelphia uh, and uh, of her father. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to stop it here uh, and thank everyone for participating. Um, I think we could talk about this image a lot more, but it's 12. Um, so I want to give everybody who perhaps has a 12 o'clock uh, the chance to um, see uh, the, the ending. Let me turn off this little pointer thing. Um, the reference list. Uh, these are all things about visual thinking strategies and various applications. Um, these are the images. Uh, and so um, the, this is an alphabetical order. So um, the image of the bird lady um, is the creation of birds by Remedios Vero, uh, a surrealist painter. Um, it was circa 1957. Some people say 1958. Um, and uh, there is a link here to a listing on wiki art, but you can learn a lot about um, this painting just by Googling it. And in fact, um, Evan was making some observations that I think connect to this New York Times article. Um, oh no, that has a, a login in the URL. Hold on. Uh, let me get rid of that and see if you can access that. Um, the second uh, image is Philip Gustin. Um, 1940, exactly. Um, it's held at the MoMA and it's called Gladiators. Um, and so uh, that is some information that you could use to research these images if you want. Um, and I just wanted to ask if anybody has any questions now that you have experienced a visual thinking strategies conversation uh, about the method or about anything else I talked about um, in the session. And I'm happy to share the slides themselves. I'll know, I know that there's a recording, but if you are interested in these references, um, and there specifically is a book. Um, I actually have a copy of it here that I'm happy to lend to anyone, assuming that quarantine never ends, um, called Visual Thinking Strategies, Using Art to Deepen Learning Across School Disciplines by Philip Yenwin. Um, and this is, uh, if you're interested, in um, its applications in different academic fields, this article, Visual Thinking Strategies equals creative and critical thinking, uh, that should be in the sentence case, sorry, um, is also good. You're welcome, everyone. Am I missing any questions? Let's see. I have one question, but if someone yeah. else had one in the chat, I can wait. I didn't see any questions in the chat. Okay. okay. Um, Sam is sharing um, future sessions. Joe has a question. Uh, jo yeah, Vanessa, I, I will figure out a way to make the slides available. Um, in addition to there is a recording of the presentation. Um, and uh, I would say if anyone wants to stick around, say hello, turn on their webcams, we can end the recording and Joe and I can chat.